This is Ecotricity's Ecotech Roundup show from Aotearoa's first and only climate positive certified renewable electricity provider. We only source from wind, hydro and solar and we are the leading supplier of electricity to electric vehicles in Aotearoa. Switch today at ecotricity.co.nz. Welcome back to another roundup of news from the world of clean cars and green energy. Thanks for joining me. There's more bad news for EV startup Fisker this week, news which could lead to a good EV deal for those in markets willing to buy an ocean EV where they're sold. After Fisker confirmed a potential deal with an anonymous major automaker, believed by many to be Nissan, fell through, its stock took a tumble this week, causing the New York Stock Exchange to halt trading of Fisker shares, ultimately delisting Fisker completely. Several investors in the firm are now talking publicly about when, rather than if, the firm will declare bankruptcy, and toward the middle of the week, in an attempt to raise extra funds, Fisker announced its Ocean EV was getting a massive price cut in order to sell inventory. The entry-level Ocean Sport is now available for $25,000 for those willing to take a risk on the company's future. Ford has officially begun sales of the Explorer EV in Europe. Built on Volkswagen's MEB platform, the start of sales of the Explorer EV was delayed from the end of last year, but the delay has caused some important changes in specs. There's now a new 77 kilowatt hour battery pack with up to 374 miles, 600 kilometers on the European test cycle, as well as a more powerful all wheel drive version with 70 9 kilowatt hour battery pack. Ford plans a more affordable model with a 52 kilowatt hour battery pack option soon. The delayed launch coincided with the return of Explorer Lexi Alford, who has just driven around the world in a pre production Explorer EV to claim what Ford says is the first circumnavigation of the globe in an EV. It's a phenomenal achievement, although we should note that this is not the first round the world EV trip that we are aware of. A new report from the European Commission yet again cast doubt on the notion that plug-in hybrids are good for the planet this week. Taking into account plug-in hybrid use across the EU, the study showed that plug-in hybrid emissions do depend greatly on where vehicles are in the EU. But taking into account at averages, it showed that both petrol and diesel plug-in hybrids are responsible for about three and a half times the WLTP quoted emission figures in the real world, with diesel plug-in hybrids emitting almost as many tailpipe emissions as the WLTP test cycles for a non-plug-in diesel vehicle. Given that many major automakers are pushing back their EV plans to focus on plug-in hybrids as a green alternative, this study should give cause for concern. While Tesla's full self-driving feature is still officially in beta test phase, Tesla CEO Elon Musk issued some new instructions to Tesla sales staff this week regarding the feature. First, Musk mandated that all Tesla sales staff install and demo full self-driving beta on every new Tesla being delivered in North America, something which may lead to more customer sales, but which we should also note will also increase the workload for Tesla sales staff. Stating in a company email that he wants customers to realize, quote, how well supervised FSD actually works, end quote, Musk also confirmed later in the week that Tesla was now going to offer a full month of complimentary FSD beta access to every Tesla capable of operating in the mode. FSD subscription after this is nearly $200 a month. The People's Republic of China has formally filed a complaint with the World Trade Organization against the US over the White House's Inflation Reduction Act. As part of the IRA, the US federal government put into place a new electric vehicle incentive scheme that prioritizes domestic-made EV and battery packs over imported ones. And that, says the Chinese Ministry of Commerce, is discriminatory. While automakers from other countries have also expressed 
expressed frustration about the IRA and federal tax credit program. It's worth noting that China appears to be the first to take its grievances to the WTO in this manner. China says the US is ignoring WTO rules and urges it to change its policies. That said, it is also worth noting that the EU recently found China guilty of unfairly subsidizing Chinese-made EVs to undercut European-made EVs. Last week, we shared the news that Volkswagen seems open at least to the idea of bringing its ID2-based Volkswagen ID GTI to North America, and now the firm has confirmed the Volkswagen ID7 is heading stateside too. According to the company, the ID7 will be offered in the US and we can assume Canada as well, with Pro S and Pro S Plus trim variants with rear-wheel drive and all-wheel drive options. Due to go on sale as a 2025 model, we don't have official pricing for any North American ID7s yet. But as Electrek noted this week, the ID7 will be made in Germany for North American customers. So it's unlikely, at launch at least, that the vehicle will attract federal tax credits. When we know more about launch pricing and ordering, we will share. Chinese automaker Neo, and thanks to those of you who corrected my pronunciation of the name, has begun production of what's going to be the world's fastest charging EV. The Neo ET9, which we first saw late last year, started series production on Wednesday this week, complete with its 900 volt electrical drive system and an onboard battery pack that can accept fast charging rates at 925 volts DC at current levels of 765 amps, or about 600 kilowatts. When paired with a suitable charger, Neo claims the ET9 can add more than 150 miles, 255 kilometers of range in five minutes under optimal conditions. While that's likely going to be measured using the Chinese cycle testing and real world range is likely to be near about 70% of that, it is still incredibly quick. Polestar will officially debut its Polestar 4 in the US this weekend at the 2024 New York Auto Show and as such has confirmed pricing and delivery plans for the same. Starting at $54,900 for the long-range rear-wheel drive variant and $62,900 for the long-range dual motor with pilot pack, Polestar says it will open up the order books in the US and Canada in late April for Polestar 4 with the deliveries due to start in the fourth quarter of this year. Polestar is confident the SUV Coupe will be popular in North America thanks to its onboard tech, its 200 kilowatt DC charging and up to 300 mile, 482 kilometers of range. It's sized between the Polestar 2 and Polestar 3. While many automakers have been dialing back their electrification plans, the Hyundai Motor Group, which includes Hyundai, Kia and Genesis sub-brands, has been doubling down. This week, the Motor Group went further, committing to investing 68 trillion won, about 50 billion US dollars, to help it prepare for a new, cleaner future across its brands. While some of that investment will focus on next generation mobility projects like aviation, software defined vehicles, autonomous driving, and robotics, a sizable amount of the investment will go towards expanding the group's EV portfolio. I should note, however, that I used a translation tool to read the Korean press release, which also, <laughs> via the translation, claimed that it would reuse 13,000 elderly people. So something may, I hope, have been lost in translation. From companies pushing into EV projects to ones backing off now, with some bad news from both Stellantis and Ford. On Tuesday, Stellantis announced that it had reached a voluntary deal with unions to cut at least 2,500 staff from its facilities in Italy, including around 300 staff at the production facility where the Fiat 500e is currently made. The layoffs will be voluntary in nature, with those opting to leave being given, quote, financial incentives, end quote, to help them on their way.
This week, Ford also confirmed that it will be cutting the number of its staff at the Rouge production facility, where it makes the Ford F-150 Lightning on April 1st. Only one third of its current workforce is expected to retain their positions following that. Blaming lower than expected demand, Ford is turning its attention to more affordable global electric vehicle models. Before we get to the last two stories, I have a quick question. Are you in the market for a new EV? If you are, then you live in Aotearoa. You should really check out our very own buyer's guide at ecotricity.co.nz. It's packed with all the information you need to pick a car that's right for you and includes plenty of details about available vehicles, daily life with an EV and so much more. So follow the link below and start your journey today. Over the past few weeks, we've seen Tesla open up its supercharger network in North America to non-Tesla customers for the first time using approved NAX to CCS adapters to charge. Currently, Ford and Rivian owners have access to US Tesla superchargers that aren't already fitted with magic docks, but over the coming weeks and months, more automakers are expected to follow suit. As we recently explained, however, not all Tesla superchargers are open to non-Tesla customers, with V2 superchargers all incapable of supplying CCS-capable cars, and not all Tesla sites with V3 and newer superchargers open because of demand. This week, however, we did learn just how many of Tesla's 25,000 supercharger stalls are open to non-Tesla customers in the US, and the figure's pretty impressive. According to Ronan Patel, VP of Public Policy and Business Development at Tesla, around 16,000 Tesla supercharger stalls are currently non-Tesla friendly, and that number will only get larger. That is a, frankly, massive increase in available EV charging for non-Tesla owners. And finally, while some automakers have been backtracking on past promises made about EV production and others appear to be looking towards replacing their EV commitments with plug-in hybrids, Volvo seems to be staying true to an all-electric future. This week, it took another step towards ending the production of internal combustion engines for good, with its last diesel-powered vehicle, a Volvo XC90, rolling off the production line for the last time. That vehicle is, apparently, off to Volvo's World of Volvo Museum in Gothenburg, where it will stand witness to a smellier, dirtier past for generations to come. Sadly, though, while Volvo is committed to going all-electric and plans on ending internal combustion engine production completely very soon, its namesake, Commercial Sibling, as Electric noted this week, is still producing sizable volumes of suck, squeeze, bang, blow for some time to come. Granted, they are different companies, but I think we're all eager to see diesel give its last death rattle so we can move to a cleaner, greener future. And on that note, we are in fact done for today. Before I go, though, do make sure you've hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on the latest in EV news from this channel. And if you haven't already switched, it's time to switch to Aotearoa's first and only climate positive certified renewable electricity provider. It's super easy to make the switch and you'll help the nation wean itself off dirty energy and onto clean green power that will keep the land beautiful. I'll be back next week as usual. But in the meantime, be sure to check out other great content on this channel, including that from the lovely Gavin Kiwi EV Shoebridge. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. I hope the rest of your day is amazing. Kakite! See you next time.